All right. Hello and welcome everyone to the final day of this year's STLV and the morning lecture will be blend and we'll continue with uh, event structures and I think how to build them right in a how to work sensible with fashion. Right. So I'll be telling you about the secret weapon for working with event structures. Um, uh, what happened was that um, I put event structures aside. I did, I did the work on event structures in my thesis and then uh, uh, a year or two later, and then work on kind of generalized domain theory. And then uh, at one point, I had an intern called Sylvain Fredo, who had a chat from me in Paris, and we started working on games. Um, and um, in in doing those, in, in basically making these games work on event structures, the techniques of stable families, which were really from the early 80s, came into their own again. Um, and they've really been a kind of central pillar in the development of these uh, concurrent games and strategies. So I'm going to tell you about them. Um, and uh, remember, when we worked with event structures, when we were doing things like looking at the product of event structures, that one of the central features of, of event structures was that an event was associated with a unique causal history. And that was getting in the way a little bit when we did constructions. We had to make copies of, of uh, if you remember that um, B star, there were two, two, uh, there were two events of form B star that we had to copy according to whether they were uh, associated with an earlier synchronization or not. So stable families give us a way around these kinds of issues. Uh, so here's what they are. They're a kind of direct um, axiomatization of configurations of event structures, plus a little bit with, with a bit more generality, so that we allow an event to occur in two incompatible ways. So here's um, an axiom axiomatization of what a stable family is. It's a non-empty family of finite sets, as it says here, uh, and it satisfies um, complete this condition. Now what this is saying is if you have some uh, some set of set within the family, some subset of configuration Z, which is compatible above. In other words, every element of the configuration Z is below the some particular configuration, uh, what do I call it, X A, such that every configuration in Z is below X. Okay. Then in that case, so maybe I'll draw pictures again, not a bad idea. So we've got a whole collection of configurations, which together form this family of configurations there. And they're all such that they're inside some, some big, they're all inside some big configuration here. Then in that case, you can take the union of all of those, and that will be a configuration. Okay. So in particular, it might be you just had two elements, uh, Z1 and Z2, and they were underneath X. Then you could form Z1, then you could form Z1 union Z2, and that would be a configuration above both of them and below X. Okay. Uh, then the other uh, axiom. Now, if you think about, if you want to kind of do, a, do a sanity check, you can think about an event structure as we saw it yesterday and consider finite configurations of such an event structure. And you wouldn't find it very hard to realize all of these axioms on, on, this, on this regarded. This will be an example of a stable family, a rather special kind of stable family. And all the axes will hold that. So if you think about the axes there, if you have a whole load of configurations which were inside some other configuration, uh, they would be in, then if you take the union of all those configurations and that itself would be a configuration, it would itself be down as well as it exists because it was inside the bigger configuration. Then the stability. And that says if you have a non empty a subfamily of configuration Z. Uh, 
which is compatible above, then you can actually form its intersection. And that will be a configuration as well. So in particular, if you have two configurations, Z1 and Z2, which were inside X, then you can form the configuration Z1 intersect Z2. And that will be a configuration as well. So again, if we think about configurations of, uh, of an event structure, you have two configurations, Z1 and Z2 of an event structure, which are inside some other configuration, then their interact intersection will also be a configuration. It will also be down with those and consistent. Right. Then there's a funny axiom, which is like a, one of the separation axioms, separation axioms in topology, which is saying that if you have a configuration, X, which has got two uh, distinct events in it, E and E prime, not equal to each other, then you can find a sub configuration of X, which contains one and not the other. So it might contain this one, or it might, and not the other one, or it might contain this one and not the other one. So there's a way of separating uh, events within a, within a configuration by a sub configuration. All right. Um, okay. So um, again, you can check that that will hold of configurations in the traditional event structure. So what's what's the generality here? Let me show you something that's a stable family, but not configurations of an event structure. So here we could start off with, uh, with the empty uh, empty configuration, and we have singleton A, singleton B. And then we have the configuration of B. And we might have an event C that occurs after A. But we might also have an event C which occurs, the same event C occurring after B. That would be a stable family that wouldn't be associated with configurations of an event. Because if you look at this event C, it can occur in two different ways, either after A or after B. And yet it's still the same event. Okay. Now that, that generality is not present in the original configuration. And it's that generality we have with uh, the stable patterns, <coughs> which is very useful. Right? So making sense? Yeah. Uh, probably would work the other way, would it? Um, yes, it probably would work with just an implication. I think that's you were right. Is that true? Um, exercise if E was, um, so imagine you just had the implication one way. Then E, uh, no, I think you need both. I think you need equal hands there. Is that right? Do you think I'm wrong? Oh, no, oh for fine, yeah. <clears throat> I think you need both. In, in, yeah, I think you need both. Yes? So uh, I was thinking if you have some mean implication, so you are there, and you also write the fact that you can have the configuration with only two elements and a sub configuration with only one of them. And if you have the implication, you have to have the implication with the other. You have the implication first. With your same thing. I will leave it as a, an exercise. I'm pretty sure you need you need the equivalence there. So yeah. So so, yeah. so if E, so you're saying you can replace it by E member of Y implies E prime not a member of Y. Uh, oh and oh then then you're just saying the same as the equivalence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, this, this is a, this is saying e. Yeah, this, this is this is saying e member of y implies. It's not, it's not a great question. I just there is the spirit where you can add any of the questions. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the argument's about, but yeah. but but this 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 is the bona fide definition. Okay, in this case, this is separation. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, all right. So, uh, sure. Um, the thing about the event, that's such a disjunctive causes with Mark, that allowed parallel causes as well. That would allow um, an event C to occur. Yes. Uh, and then that could all be compatible. So that's, then it would be within, so you could have, so here the, the two different causes one by, they can't occur together in, with, with C. Okay, that's, that's right, yeah. So you don't have the configuration CAB. Whereas in, in in parallel causes you would have. So this is so this is uh, this is kind of um, dis, disjoint causes or disjunct causes. Okay. Um, all right. So the point the point of going to this generality is that uh, you've gone more general, but you've not gone that much more general. Um, uh, we'll be able to recover an event structure. From such a stable family. Um, uh, but before we do that, we'll just observe a few things which are, are kind of uh, like local versions of the global versions of causal dependency we saw, saw earlier. So if you have a configuration, have a configuration X, then within that, you can put an order on its events. Namely, you can say that. Uh, E prime is below E in X if any subconfiguration of X which contains E contains E prime. So again, maybe a picture is helpful. X, the configuration X looks like this. We have E here, we have E prime here. And what we're saying is um, that any subconfiguration which contains E has also got to contain E prime. There can be subconfigurations that contain E prime, but don't, uh, don't, contain, don't contain E. But if you have that, then in that particular situation, you have uh, the E prime, which is less than or equal to E inside the configuration. You have a local notion of causal dependency associated with each configuration. And because of this axiom of coincidence freeness that, that separates events by subconfigurations, this will be a partial order. You can't have two events which are in the same subconfigurations because of coincidence freeness. So that means that we do have that this is a partial order here. All right. Also, within such a configuration X, you can look at the um, uh, we've got this axiom that says if we have a, a non-empty collection of configurations which is compatible above, then we can form this intersection. So if we look at configuration X and we look at an event E, we can look, we can look at all of the sub-configurations that contain it. And we can take the intersection of all of those. And that will be a configuration. And by construction, it will be the smallest, smallest subconfiguration of X, which contains E. And that we call uh, the downward closure of E in X. Okay. Uh, and that will be it's a little exercise, but that will coincide with the uh, local downward closure with respect to this local relation of causal dependency. With a little exercise to check that that um, this is the same as this expression here, given in this way that the intersection of all subconfigurations which contain E, so that means that we uh, that that we will have that the uh, this downward closure with respect to X really is a down is the downward closure of this local partial order uh, in X. So intuitively, what it's saying, if we have a stable family, uh, it won't be the case that we necessarily can glue all of these local partial orders together to get a global partial order. That's not the case. But local to any configuration, we do have a notion of causal dependency. 
And we have a, a notion of, if you like, the, the minimal way in which an event can occur. Uh, all right, so that's uh, that's kind of useful. It means that when we come, when we come, one comes to work with stable families instead of event structures, locally they behave like event structures, and globally we can make an event structure from such a stable family. We do it by essentially rechristening the events to make sure they come along with their causal dependence. So here we have two occurrences of C, one occurring after A, one occurring after B. So, and if we thought about the downward closure of C was with respect to this configuration, it would actually be this whole configuration. And if we think of the downward closure of C, uh, with respect to this configuration, it would have to, it would have to be this whole configuration. It needs needs C needs B in order to occur. So um so what we do is we if you like we get an event structure from this guy by rechristening the events. We say ah we don't just now have an event two we, we now now have an event C after A and another event C after B. So that's what we that's what we do, and we have, of course we have another event which is just got by getting A and B in the, there are also events. Um, all right, so um, so that's what we're doing here. We're taking um, we're going to construct an event structure with a stable family by rechristening the events. We take all of the uh, we take for every configuration we can get and every event within that configuration. We look at the smallest way that that event can occur. And we regard that that is like the event together with the minimal way in which it was caused with respect to that configuration. And that's what we now take to be our new events. These, this is now going to be the events of an event structure of the old kind. The, uh, we can take consistency to just be if these configurations are consistent in the stable family, in the sense that they're compatible, there's a configuration that's bigger than all of them. And we can take causal dependency to just be got by inclusion. That makes sense too. So, so what we've got from a stable family, we've got a way of constructing a, an event structure. So if we do a construction that gives us a stable family, in this kind of way, we can tap out by rechristening the events, we can tap out an event structure. Uh, yeah? Sure. So, with all of this, you're mashing down a lot of the structure of events and configurations into a partial order. What happens if you hold on to? In a way, I suppose that's what I'm doing with this rechristening of events. Yeah, you see, that's what's happening. You, this, this is this. That's what this is really. It's e together with relative to configuration. E together with the reasons why the minimal reasons why e is in the configuration. That's what that is. Yeah. Minimal in the sense of this was the initial. Uh, minimal in the sense it's the intersection of all. Remember how we see this uh, E, um, the downward closure of E and X was the intersection of all the sub configurations of X which contain E. So it is minimal in that sense. Yes. It's going to be inside any configuration that contains E, and moreover, it's configuration itself. Minimal in that sense, in terms of being the smallest in terms of the respect to the inclusion of it. Yeah, no, that's right, you can't. No, no, there are many, um, 
So, you know, you might, you might have X and Y, and they may well have, you know, the same, you know, E, e might be in both of them, and E of X equals E of Y. So there are lots of little emmas to show that that doesn't really matter too much. And so forth. Okay. Now, um, as you might expect here, um, there's an, there's, well, it was one of my conversion points. You know, I was, it was early on in my career. It wasn't, in my day, category theory was something that some people just said, no, no, come on, there's no point using category theory. It just makes things complicated. Um, and a lot of people, to be honest, were just taking things and making them complicated by using category theory. And that was a lot of what was going on then. Uh, and sometimes it, there wasn't much obvious point. But for, but for me, but, and I, I've been conv convinced through Gordon's, Gordon Plotkin's work on using category theory for solving domain equations with Mike, Mike Smith, that so there was a lot to it there. But in concurrency, it wasn't obvious. Uh, and the fact that this construction, which occurred to me before I knew its kind of categorical significance, the fact that this turns out to be a right adjoint of an adjunction was one of my conversion points to category theory. Um, it's hard to go back to a time when people were skeptical in theoretical computer sciences, in, at least in the semantic side, were skeptical about category theory, but that was definitely the case in the, uh, in the 70s and the early 80s. And I had friends who told me, don't do this stuff, don't. And afterwards really said, sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> um, now, um, um, uh, now, so what's the, what, what's the underlying categorical story here? It's, um, as I said, there's an adjunction. So, we've got two categories around, really. We've got the category of events, I think we saw that last time. And so you've got, you'll we'll have to go with the name for it, but that's a category of event structure, so. And remember what those maps were. They were partial functions uh, on the underlying events, which were such that they uh, took a configuration by direct image to a configuration, and moreover, in a locally injected way. So you didn't get two events in a configuration collapsing to a common, a common event without making all these things. Uh, there's another category around the stable families, I'll call it pattern. And um, uh, and of course, the notion of map that I've just described applies equally well for those as well. Because you could talk about um, a map of stable families, you could talk about the events of a stable family just being the union of all of the elements that appear in a configuration. And then you could say that the uh, uh, map of stable families was a um, uh, partial function on the underlying events which was such that it took uh, the direct image of a configuration on the left to a configuration on the right in a locally injective way. So basically, the maps make sense. The same notion of map makes sense here. So you've got an obvious inclusion factor from event structures into stable families. Namely, you take an event structure to the stable family, which is just all the configurations. But what's nice in this case is there's a right adjoint to that, which is this PR construction. And what that's doing is taking stable family to the event structure given by rechristening the primes and taking them to be the events together with their, uh, their minimal causes. So that turns out to be a right adjoint. Okay, so, um, so this is an example of an adjunction. And uh, if you don't know about adjunctions, it's not really the time for me to explain them, but they're, um, if you've met Galois connections, then you'll know examples of adjunctions on partial orders. But they're concerned with, if you like, having two ways of looking at the world expressed in two categories. And then um, the adjoint is very intuitively, the adjunction is intuitively saying how to 
given um, a view, say, as an event, given a view of computation, say, an event structure, what's the best way of viewing this, that computation of a uh, stable family? And moreover, if you've got a stable family, what's the best way of viewing that as an event structure? Yeah. Okay, so do that. Do that. That's right. Now, when you do these exercises on a junction, you'll find there are um, some particular maps that come out, which are called the unit and the co -unit. So what you can do is you can start out with an event structure, you can go away and get configurations, and then you can come back and take the primes of that. So, sorry, I'm, I'm calling these, I'm calling these min these events together with their minimal way, minimal way of of occurring, I'm calling them prime configurations. <coughs> now, <coughs> when you do this prime construction here on something that was originally on configurations that originally came from an event structure, they'll um, they'll end up not really depending on on the x. They'll end up just being given in a more absolute way. Uh, they'll just be the downwards closure of of the event. In other words, the event together with all the events on which you call them. Um, and so there'll be an obvious map of event structures which will take an event over to its downward state. And that will be a map of event structures. Uh, and moreover, you can actually show it's an isomorphism. So you Go to all this trouble, you take your event structure, you get a stable family out of it, and then you recover these local uh, local best ways or minimal ways in which an event can occur. And, and lo and behold, you get the same thing that you got you, you could have got right at the beginning, namely the configuration, which is the smallest configuration containing E. And that turns out to give you an isomorphism. It's really just renaming the events of the original event structure and replacing them by their downwards closure. So that's an awesome mechanism. So this adjunction is a rather special one. It's one where you can go away from event structures and then come back. You end up pretty much where you started, at least to within isomorphism. And those things are, are sometimes called co-reflections. Co so it's a very special kind of adjunction. So that's the that's uh, uh, that's the unit of the adjunction. There's also the co unit of the adjunction, and I don't know if I need to bother spelling that one out particularly. Let me just think. Uh, I, won't, I won't bother. Um, maybe I will. So, what you do, what this does, is you start out with a stable family. You go to this event structure, and then you take its configurations, finite configurations. Uh, and this time, there's an obvious map this way. I call it the top. And what that does, it takes an event of this, which looks like this, remember, and takes it to just E. So showing that that's well defined is a little bit, requires a little bit of effort. It, re it depends crucially on the coincidence fields axis to show to show to show that by coincidence <laughs> you show we have e x equals e prime y, but that implies that e equals e prime. Little left. That can be an exercise. So that gives you this well. This is well defined. And uh, this you can think of as being the top element. And what this gives you is an isomorphism between the um, these uh, the, the configurations of the um, uh, original stable family, the order isomorphism between the configurations of the original stable family uh, and what you and the uh, configurations of the of the event structure that you construct. So this um, this bit of generality, this adjunction, is very helpful. One of the reasons why it's helpful is that um, 
another conversion point for me, this kind of weird thing, was that if I want to know what products are here, and remember they were problematic, they're not so obvious, then there's an obvious thing I can do. I'm interested in the product of A and B, so I take my A and B and I form stable families. And then, I need to tell you how to do it, but then I can form the product of those as stable families, and that will be easier to form than the product of the structures. And right edge joints, like this PR guy here, preserve products. So when I go over by PR, Just use PR everywhere. Yeah. Then what I know is uh, I get a product again. And moreover, because I know that the unit is a uh, an isomorphism, I know that that's a product of the original event structures A and B. So we're using the fact that we have a special adjunction of co-reflection here to get to be able to construct uh, products of event structures in terms of products of stable numbers. But I better tell you what products of stable families are, and uh, they're not wonderfully easy, but they're much easier than the, uh, than you might think. Okay, any questions about that? There's a little bit of, little bit allusions to category theory that might have confused some of you, but please, I, if I can help, I'm happy to. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, so I'm not going to talk to what this about. Um, ah, here we are. That's what I wanted to show you. So, how do you produce the product of two stable families? So, stable family A and stable family B. And how do you produce that product? Well, as you might expect, because we're looking the underlying maps on uh, multiples of stable family, the partial functions, we're going to build the stable family out of events which are built from the product in sets with partial functions of the underlying events A and B. So we build our stable family out of subsets of things like this, A star, star B, and AB. We saw these yesterday. So, so we're going to take our uh, configurations of our products are going to be subsets of uh, of such things which we think of as being events that are either being synchronized or being unsynchronized. <coughs> and then we basically write down what we need to write down for the product to behave correctly. We want the projections to be mapped, for example, um, and so on. So what's a what's a no, no, you don't have to. You don't have to start with uh, these are not quite pointed sets. These are these are just I'm using stars to represent them. Yes. So just um, so they literally literally those things. So then you take a, a configuration of um, the product of stable families. That's going to be a subset, as I said, of these funny events of this kind here. And because we want the projections to be maps, we or maps of stable families. We we want that the direct images are uh, in um, when we take the first projection, the second projection, end up being configurations of the right things of A and of B. And we also want these to be, we want them to be maps and want them to be locally injected. So we say if they, uh, if, uh, if they on one side or the other project to the same thing, then they better be equal. And then we want, we want coincidence freeness as well within our stable family. So we say that, um, we say that in this way. We say that if we have, if we have two events which are distinct, then there exists some Y, which is such that it's it's one of these things that we're thinking of as a configuration. 
In other words, it's one of these things which is such that if you project it onto the left and onto the right, you get configurations, and moreover, it separates those two into ones. And that's the definition of the product. And that drawing I drew yesterday of the product, and that, that it was kind of universal with respect to some other candidate product, that will hold you that by virtue of these choices. Not saying it's that obvious. But it's uh, it's not involving any inductive definitions at all. It's fairly straightforward. You're basically writing down what you need to write down for the projections to be mapped, together with an extra wriggle the way you want to say you want to, the way you want to say that the uh, you ensure that you have coincidence figures that you can separate distinct events by subcategorization. All right. So now. Uh, as I said, because of um, right eye joints preserving products, we now know what products are in event structures. We name them, namely, we form the products in stable families and then bring them back over by taking the event structures we run them as stable families by taking their configurations, form the products of stable families there, and then bring them back uh, by using this PR construction, renaming the event in order to, to get um, to get an event structure. Sorry, yeah. Presumably, you can definition. You get a direct definition for that structure. Uh, yes. Okay. Looks probably more stable. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. And of course, you can do that. And way back in the um, early eighties, you can bet they did it. Yeah. Mm. But it's but it's a way of kind of understanding. So so basically, what this is saying is, uh, when you work with event structures, they're very nice, they're very economical, and they support hiding. Stable families don't support hiding uh, in, in, in anything like direct direct anything. So you can work. You have to work with event structures a lot of the time. But but uh, in doing constructions like pockets and pullback, as we'll see in a moment, then using stable families families and thinking there is the way to go. There are, yeah. Oh, there are other models you could use, by the way. Uh, but the stable families have the advantage of being just kind of what you need on the nose. They're just axiomatizing exactly what you need of the configurations. There are ways of putting extra causal connections in. There are ways of having enabling relations rather than uh, causal dependency. Uh, and Or there are even ways of uh, allowing an event to causally depend on inconsistent things, but then you only take consistent parts and so on. But it's all rather complicated, and there are certain there are certain things that don't work terribly well. This 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 is the most canonical model I can think of that generalizes generalizes just enough to make things work technically. Yeah. What about other scenarios? Yes, there are products. Uh, if you, um, well, the co products would just be um, with event structures, you can define them, define them directly. And right. the same as they were found, you just take disjoint, disjoint unions. Um, uh, yeah, uh, that's right, with conflict between the things. That's exactly right. Um, that's uh, so on the configurations, it would just be a disjoint union, and you you don't you don't make them yeah. you know, conflict at all. Um, uh, but pullbacks are worth saying because we'd be using pullbacks um, in composing in composing strategy. Sorry, I'm a bit tired today. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, there are functions. Yes, um, those DI domains I mentioned, they have Cartesian flows. You can use these stable families to give a definition of the function space as well. And the function space will be built out of events which were of the form finite configuration of the something on the left together with an event of the thing on the right. So you can build a stable family on these, and this will be a function space. Okay. Now, of course, we're talking about with respect to stable, uh, stable functions, Alaberry and so on. Okay. But this is, uh, you can also do dependent types with stable families too. Um, so that so you can you can uh, in the eighties uh, Girard was was doing kind of domain theoretic constructions um, on 
stable domains, but only rather restricted kinds. And those, those constructions lift to event structures, so you can do dependent types and so on. But this is with, with respect to slightly more general morphisms than the ones you're, you're seeing, the ones that appear as special strategies, in fact. All right, um, how are we doing? Uh, a very important construction, and someone was wanting to use this, I think, yesterday in a more informal way, is that of uh, pullbacks. I better say what they are. So you might have two systems, two processes, which share some common interface expressed by having maps go to some common event structures. Then it's very useful to combine those systems, taking into account that they share this common interface. So one for doing that, one can do a, a pullback construction, which is a bit like a, a kind of a sub substructure. What a pullback is, it's um, it's, if you like, the best way of joining these A and B together, taking account of this common interface, in the sense that it's a pair of, it's a, an object, uh, A wedge B, with a pair of maps here, which are such that uh, this diagram here commutes. If you go this way around, it's the same as going this way. And moreover, it's the best such guy. So if you take some D here, a pair of maps, which make the um, surrounding square commute. So this followed by this is the same as this followed by this. Then there is a unique map here, H, which makes these two triangles here commute. And that's, if you like, the best way of joining these two systems represented by event structures together, knowing that they share a common existence. Now, in the case where these are Fs are total maps of event structures or total maps of stable families. Uh, the pullback has a particularly nice characterization. Uh, and where, how much we'll get to talk about concurrent kind of strategies, I don't know. But this particular example of pullback is central to the composition of strategies. So it's worth talking about. So here, it's um, you can think of this as a kind of restriction of the product, but it turns out that when you look at pullbacks, a lot of uh, what, what was previously necessary goes away. So here's uh, here's what the pullback looks like, and then I'll give another characterization explanation on the next slide. So what you do is you now take your underlying events of the stable family you're going to construct for the pullback. To be just pairs now. None of this A star, star B nonsense, just have pairs A, B, where they agree, where A and B look the same relative to the, to the common interface. Well, yeah, look the same relative to the common inter interface C. So it's F of A equals G of B. Remember, we're thinking of, we're assuming that F and G are total maps. And then what's the configuration of this pullback? It's a finite subset of D, which is such that uh, it looks like a configuration. When you project it to A, when you project it to A, you get a configuration. When you project it to B, you get a configuration. And you don't need now to say that it's that uh, the pi one and pi two are lo locally injected, because that will follow. Because if you have two events, say A, B, one, and A, B, two, that are going to a common thing on the left, they're going to A, then you'll know that F, the G of B1, will have to equal G of B2. Uh, and that will be, and they'll be inside the configuration. So, so one will have that automatically from G being locally injected, one will have the B1 to B2. So you don't need to write down local, um, local injectivity or anything, that's just that. And then you just say, ah, oh, enough to guarantee uh, coincidence treatments. You have two distinct events, then there's a, uh, a candidate subconfiguration, which separates. 
that's what that's one way of saying what a pullback is. There's another way that you might find intuitive. Uh, the coincidence premise is a way of making sure that that local causal dependency that one gets relative to configuration, that that's a function of it. And so there's a way of actually saying what the configurations are of this stable family uh, more directly in terms of the partial orders. So uh, here's another way, it follows from that characterization of the this, this, uh, this other characterization follows fairly directly. The notes I'm going to refer, refer you to give more proofs of all of these things. Uh, the finite configuration of the pullback um, actually can be described in another way. Here it is. What you have, you imagine that you have two configurations, X and Y, which go, which image in the, inter, in the interface C, common interface C, they look the same. So F of X equal G of Y. Now, because these maps F and G are total maps, and they're also locally injected, you know you have a bijection between X and F of X, and Y and G of Y. So by taking the composite here, you have a bijection between X and Y. The bijection is giving you a synchronization between the events little a of X and little b of Y, and say, produce a synchronization event A, B. It's giving a set of, the bijection is giving you a set of such pairs, A, B. Now, um, but not any old bijection would work to give you a configuration of the pullback. What you can do is, you can look at uh, a relation between those pairs induced by the causal dependencies on the components. You could say that A, B, was below A prime B prime if in one component, say the A component, that in X that A was below A prime, or in the other component Y, B was below B prime. In other words, um, you're inheriting the causal dependencies on these pairs from dependencies on the components. Now, what you insist on in order for such a bijection to represent a configuration of Back, is that the ensuing order here is uh, is a partial order. In other words, you don't get two distinct events, A, B, and A prime, B prime, which are um, both re related in both ways by this, I mean, equivalent, uh, equivalent by this relation. So in other words, you can see the pullback as consisting of configurations X and uh, uh, consisting of um, two configurations X and Y, which are matched together by pairing them together in a synchronized by synchronizations in such a way that when you do that, you don't when you take account of the uh, causal dependencies of the components, you don't introduce any causal groups. So uh, that's what the pullback. Um, that's a way of thinking about the pullback. Um, all right. Yeah. So this would be total maps. These are total maps. Yeah. 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 Uh, yes. Yes. That's right. There'll be quite. Um, there's some. There's some junk. You get some extra junk in the pullback because of the stars. Um, so, for example, if if an event A went to undefined on one side and the event B went to undefined on the other side, you synchronize them together. To something A B, um, and that, something, yeah, yeah, it, yes, yes, and it, it, it um, <clears throat> yes, it does, and and this pullback, it would make sense in a situation where you were thinking about, um, yeah, where you these these physically partial maps, you still have pullbacks, yeah, it would make sense there. That's right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. No, sure you're not. You're, you're yeah. defining you're defining this relation by saying that you have this <coughs> you have this if you have it in one component or the other and then 
And then you make, then you're looking at the transitive closure of that. Uh, and then, then you're saying you don't, that doesn't give you any, um, doesn't give you a proper pre order. One or the other. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, so imagine that you had, say, A, A prime, B, B prime. And uh, A says A primes after A. And B says that B prime is before B. If you synchronize them together, you get a loop there. Yeah, so you're avoiding that kind of thing. That would be a very simple loop, but the loops could occur in much more sophisticated ways, as we know from dying philosophers and so on. This is forbidding the loops. Yeah. So this is a very, very handy way of uh, thinking about pullbacks, and it's uh, central to lots of the work that we, we do. Now, um, by, by fiat, by definition, you say you don't have them. You take the ones that don't have loops. Yeah. So you take the bijections, which are such that when you, you know, inherit the dependencies you have to do from the components because the maps have to locally locally reflect all the dependencies, then you um, you don't you insist don't get any loops. This is a problem. I mean, people in quantum stuff they. They, they, quantum, you know, higher order quantum theory, they, they have problems with loops because they, they're working with the string diagrams and they impose some higher order structure on it. Um, kind of, yeah, in a certain, certain way, using combs and so on. And then they have issues uh, with these loops. Right from the start here, we do avoid them. And, uh, and, and we have, this does actually, the, the strategies do actually give us a model of uh, quantum computation without loops. So. I can't really see why we've not solved their problems, but I'm sure I, I'm sure they'll say I haven't. But um, anyhow, but but anyhow, so um, um, that's uh, now just some little things, and I'll finish. I, I'm going to go on for another half an hour, have a break, and then I'll just whistle, give a whistle, whistle stop tour about uh, um, on strategies and game. Um, but this idea of adjunctions is very important. It kind of um, was one of my conversion points to category theory, because this idea of adjunction works much more generally than I'm able to indicate here. Uh, that, uh, those unfoldings that we saw of a Petri net to an occurrence net and then to an event structure, there are uh, there examples of, of right adjuncts. Um, um, there are ways of looking at transition systems as categories two, and the kind of synchronizations that Sussman was do, with, were doing are examples of a very well, they're, they're, they're basically the pro products of, of transition systems with some restrictions to make sure you don't do arbitrary synchronization. Um, and the stuff that he was referring to by Simon Castellan, which is doing an event structure semantics to weak memory, it makes use of this product construction here. Um, in order to systematize the, the kind of uh, weak memory assumptions in ways which are analogous to what Sussman did in his first lecture. Um, there are inclusions of trees in transition systems. Those are familiar models. And the unfolding of transition systems to trees is, as you might expect, a right adjunct. Uh, and so on. And then connections between nets and event structures, as someone pointed out in the question. You do have ways of producing from an event structure, of producing an occurrence net, and that's a, that is that will now be a left adjoint, uh, and so on. And adjunctions compose. So this gives you a, a crisscross of lots of different models, but in those models, event structures are quite central. And that was a kind of design choice. Develop games with event structures because once you do it there, you'll know what to do in the other models by virtue of these adjunctions. And friends of mine are developing games. Uh, uh, Pierre Clermbo and uh, Simon Castella are developing games in terms of petri nets. In fact, in terms of colored petri nets, based on these ideas. All right. A um, little bit of uh, this. I'll make this online. There are some references for various things. If you wanted to look at proofs and so on, maybe that. And what I'm going to do in the next part is give you an idea of um, um, just give you an idea. It'll be a bit quick. I give you an idea of uh, how to develop games and strategies um, 
and we spent to do that structures and not do damages. But let's have a break of five minutes. Then. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I better. This part will be much more rapid, uh, hopefully, at least, uh, and, um, than the other part. And I'll give you an idea of um, a, bigger, a bigger picture and why we're doing this work. Um, uh, I won't give, ever say everything yet because I won't be covering the, the different paradigms, the functional ones, and showing how the special cases of the um, of paradigms that arise from uh, distributed games and strategies. But what I want to say is just um, that this is some general work, which is trying to kind of find a, a generalization of domain theory in which one's looking at computation in terms of strategies and types of uh, look, uh, appearing as games. And the games are going to be based on event structures and the strategies are going to be based on maps of event structures. Um, and it's been amazingly successful. I mean, it's been, uh, been very successful in quantitative things in a way that I never imagined. Uh, probabilistic strategies yielded themselves quite quickly. Quantum strategies, which was a, that was a much more complicated story, but uh, with uh, significant help from uh, uh, significant work from Mark Devine uh, in his PhD thesis, supervised with, by me and Pierre Clarenbo, and Pierre Clarenbo, that's, uh, that's now come into its own and has been used to solve an open problem full abstraction for a quantum lambda class. Um, all right. Uh, so what this is really doing, I suppose, is making, taking games and strategies and putting them where they really belong in a theory of interaction and a theory of interaction from a computer science perspective. So we're looking at games and strategies in a very structural way. So as you might expect, this is also beginning in my mind, to my mind, beginning to have an impact on game theory as well, which has been developed a long time ago, and often in a rather ad hoc way. All right, so for that, of course, one needs to go to multi-party games and so on, so there's more to be, more to be done. But there are the results like optimal strategies composed, winning strategies composed, and so on, like that, which back up my claims to some extent. All right, uh, I want to make some general points, uh, which I think connects up with what Sam was saying yesterday, and that's partly why I'm doing it again. Um, um, so we're thinking of, if you think about interaction with functions, you have to go through quite a lot of acrobatics to make things work. Uh, I'm far from being on top of effects and effect handlers, but I think you see there is quite a lot of acrobatics there. Uh, because initially functions are really designed just to talk about going from input to output in this kind, in the way that's illustrated here, and then you combine them in the usual way by just composing them. But you might be interested in interactions with the environment, in which case you might work with parameterized functions like this, where you think of the environment as interfering. And of course, you might interfere with the environment, environment as well. Uh, so you're working with parameterized functions of this kind here. Um, and then you might uh, then convert, combine these um, parameterized functions in various ways. But why shouldn't we? Why should the interaction just go one way, go both ways? get something like this, so you end up with quite complicated uh, interactive interactive functions looking like this, which you can then, if you have um, uh, back propagation as people are doing for uh, learn, you know, from learners and open games and so on, then you end up with something quite complicated. Um, now, um, but maybe not complicated enough, but uh, already quite complicated, but already here, when you start doing this, you've got to yeah, be a bit casual about what the nature of functions is. The thing of computational things, the functions are probably partial at least. Um, you might want them to be non-deterministic. Ah, but then we can have loops, you see. So we can have a non-deterministic data flow here really, because we could have lots of boxes linked up in such a way that we get loops. And that's known to be quite difficult to do. In fact, impossible to do with traditional semantic models. 
where you look at real, just in terms of look at relations just in terms of input and output. You're forced to work on intentional relations like profiles or stable stacks. So already there's some warnings here uh, about not being too cavalier about how you combine these functions together. Another problem is looked at this way at least is that functions and um, the usual input output types only give a rather static partial picture of of the dynamics of interaction. Um, you can use dependent types to help a little bit by saying that some things can only happen after other things and so on, but it's quite hard to do that. Um, you might imagine situations which were uh, much more complicated than this, that you followed one kind of particular paradigm for interaction at one point and later on evolved to another way of interacting, or you might non-deterministically choose between different ways of interacting with the environment, or even probabilistically choose to do that. So one needs some way to orchestrate uh, the uh, temple pattern of interaction. Now, it occurred to me yesterday that that's one thing that effect handlers, effects and effect handlers are trying to do. But it's also something that is done in another way by working with using event structures um, to do that orchestration through the medium of strategies. So I wonder if there's some kind of equation we can draw between strategies on based on event structures, which are doing this kind of orchestration and effects and event effect handlers. So that one can, for example, see uh, effect handlers as strategies. And strategies are probably more general because they talk about concurrency in a more general way. But maybe there's a generalization of effects and effect handlers to cope with concurrency at the level of event structure so that one can get some, uh, some more direct connection. I'm vague here, but I think there's something in it. There are two different ways of doing the same thing. And it's always good to see why are they really different or are they ultimately the same? And I suspect they're ultimately the same. I suspect that effect handlers can be viewed as some kind of strategies. Uh, ladies, but I don't know that yet. So that's something to, to think about. Uh, and it's a bit vague, of course. Anyhow, so we, we, the, I, the original motivation was the event structures would do that kind of orchestration for you. You see these kind of pictures. Now, why? I want to tell you about an important idea. This is very important. It's not so well known. It's a way of, um, it's a general way of making games, two-party games, into a category. <clears throat> it's a way of taking the traditional notions of strategies in a game and making converting them into strategies from one game to another. So this is an idea of really using games for interaction. And it's following a paradigm that I first heard about way back in 72 or 73 in a talk uh, that uh, um, John Conway gave to the Archimedean thing when I was a student in Cambridge, and I was dutifully going to these things in my first year. Uh, and um, I don't know if I appreciated the point very well, but he was talking about surreal numbers, uh, what, what later on became known as surreal numbers, numbers uh, which were a manifest as strengths of games, um, and so on. So here he introduced this idea, to me at least, introduced this idea of a strategy from one game to another. So, and it works quite generally. So imagine you have two party, two party games where you're thinking of player as being the process part, the part you have control over, and opponent as being like the environment. And that's why games and strategies are very, very relevant to interactive processes. Now, then we assume that we have two operations. You often do have these two operations. You have a dual game. You've got a game. You can reverse the role of player and opponent. Think about chess. You can just, you know, you've got the white and black got parallel composition of games. Think about parallel chess if you want again. You could generally, generally got that. If you've got these two notions, then you can talk about a strategy from a game G to a game H, as namely being a strategy in this compound game here, namely the dual game of H as dual game of G, 
in parallel with the game age. And why is this sensible? Because if you have another strategy going from a game H to a game K, so in this game here, then you see when there's a strategy in this of the first kind, when it sees a move in H, it will see it as a player or an opponent move. Whereas the other guy playing the strategy here will see it in the, as having the opposite polarity of being an opponent or player. So roughly, if you want to combine those two strategies and compose, compose them, what you do is you instantiate uh, the, uh, what one person sees as an opponent move by the player move of the other guy. So you compose strategies by playing them off against each other over this common game. And as you might understand that, if you're going to do that with event structures, that's where some kind of synchronization construction pullback or, so, or whatever is going to come into play. Now, um, normally when you do this, you have a kind of copycat strategy, and um, uh, which is going to act like an identity from one game to another. So it's going to be a strategy in a compound game of this form. And to bring this alive, um, it's very old, you know, chestnut, but it's something that um, is highly relevant. If you, um, here's an illustration of the copycat strategy. We think about the game chess, and we're thinking of, uh, we always take the view of the player. If we want to take the view of the opponent, then we go to the dual game. Uh, so we're thinking of uh, chess as being the game in which player plays black. And so, uh, uh, so in the dual game, player will play white. And here's, uh, here's, Here's the, con the parallel game, the dual game of chess in parallel with the original game of chess. So here, player is playing black, here, player is playing white. So how does player work? How does player do the copycat strategy? Well, what they do is they wait for someone in the environment, perhaps the grandmaster or so on, or someone to make them a white move here, then they copy it to their move over here, uh, then they wait for the other grandmaster perhaps playing a um, playing move here, black, then they copy it over here, and so on. They shuffle backwards and forwards to copy that. Quite brainlessly, just, to, just copying what the environment is telling them what to do. And in this way, they can, the joke is that even with a really stupid player, you can win against one grandmaster or another. Um, so that's uh, typically the kind of what will end up as being an identity. Uh, so, so what are these distributed games and strategies? They're essentially using the paradigm of Joel and Fenner, so Conway then, which was later on refined by Joel, uh, on event structures. But we need to um, we need to label the events to say whether they're moves of player or opponent. So we use plus for player and minus for opponent. And then, of course, there's an obvious dual construction. Just reverse the role of players for a player and opponent. And of course, there's an obvious parallel composition of games regarded as event structures, too. One of the advantages of games over three, namely, we can just take the juxtaposition of two event structures with polarity, and that will give us a parallel composition of games. And so we have a notion of a strategy from one game to another, provided we know what a strategy is. So, what is a strategy? in a game. So roughly it should be a strategy for player, should be a kind of prescription of moves that players should make dependent on the moves that opponent makes. Uh, so if we look at a copycat strategy, uh, here's an original game A, you might imagine this, this is being part of some bigger, bigger game here, or you might imagine just to be a simple game in which there's one player move depends on the previous opponent move like this. Then the dual game looks like of this form, we just reverse the polarities of the events. And then what's the copycat strategy uh, represented by an event structure? It's just following the spirit of copycat that we had before. We flip backwards and forwards, as in that game of copycat on chess. 
by, and we, and we do that by putting extra causal connections. Whatever move player wants to make on one side, they just look and see and wait for the corresponding move to be made by a problem on the other side. So parallel no, that doesn't insert this causal dependency. This is a, this is a, so the, the underlying game for the copycat is just put the two guys side by side with the reversal of polarities on one. And then what copycat does is it it's a net, it's a new event structure which puts these extra causal dependencies in. And you can show you don't get to introduce any loops in this way. And of course, one's got to be careful. This is conflict. You've got to make sure conflict is you now you've now modified the causal dependency, make sure the conflict's preserved upwards. So, but that's the full definition. That's it's, so it's a simple definition of, of copycat. In general, though, it's yeah. So you want to be there's no immediate conflict. What do you mean by that? Uh, sorry, what is it? No, so, yes, the problem says there's no really conflict between players. Oh, yes, I guess. I was, uh, yes, so there's, there's a reason for doing that. It's simply that if I impose this, then copycat strategies will be deterministic strategies, which helps me more easily. Yeah, well, just what it means. Uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. So, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, okay. What it's saying is uh, uh, you, could, you can have conflict between a player move and an opponent move. But it can't be immediate in the sense that it will always reduce to a conflict. It will always depend on conflict between either purely player moves or purely opponent moves. So it's no kind of immediate races between player and opponent. Right. And it's what ensures that uh, copycat is a deterministic strategy. Don't always need comp uh, copycat. Did I say the wrong thing? One ensures that copycat is always a deterministic strategy. Um. Yeah, on this uh, extent to event structures, the monastery is a binary of the modern of the exactly. Yes, it's just, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, it, it's, it's just easier to talk about the other ones. <clears throat> uh, all right. Yeah, so, um, but in general, it's not quite, um, it, it's easier to talk about strategies. You can't always get the strategy in a game by just adding extra causal dependence. At the very least, when you did that, you'd have to make, make duplicate events and so on. Um, uh, in general, we didn't need to copy capital. So, in general, we're going to take strategy to be a map um, from uh, a new event. You have an you have an event structure for the game. This this will be the game here. Uh, this is just Two, this is a player move in concurrently with opponent moves here. Um, and you can think of configurations of that as the positions of the game. Now, um, uh, we're going to then once we've got the game, we want to specify what moves as a player, the strategy for player we're trying to talk about. We're trying to specify what moves a player will make dependent on the way that. Uh, uh, opponent moves. So we'll we'll make that choice through another describing another event structure S, which whose events label events in the original game. And they'll do that labeling by a particular by a map of events. That makes sense because you know if you have a, a map of event structures, it preserves configurations in a locally indexed way. So if you think of a configuration of S as being like a state of play, then it tells you that that state of play goes to a position of the game. And moreover, it goes to that position in a locally injected way. So you can't make more moves in your strategy than the game allows you. Uh, so here's an example of such a strategy. It's a strategy where you're, uh, in this strategy, you're trying to answer any move of a company. If opponent doesn't make any moves, you don't make any moves at all. If opponent makes one of their moves, you make your you make your player move. So this is how you could realize that uh, as a as a strategy. You make the move if the opponent makes the left one, you make a move if the opponent makes the 
right one. But then you want to ensure local injectivity, so you make those two moves in conflict with each other. And that then gives you a map of events structure. You can see, check it's a map of events. Uh, this turns out to be a strategy, it's easy. But any old map in general is not going to be good enough because you don't want to, in your strategy, to impose any constraints on opponents that are not already there in the game. You don't want to say to opponent, wait, don't do your move because I want to do mine first, if the game allows you. Looked at rather grimly, you don't want to allow, you can't say to opponent, don't drop your bombs yet, let me drop mine first. So you don't want that kind of so so uh, so so the way that we um, uh, the way that one insists on this uh, is through two uh, axioms receptivity and innocence and what receptivity says broadly is that uh, any opponent who allowed a position in the game is reflected by the possibility of the opponent picking up move in the state of play in the in S. And moreover, that the only additional, remember, maps of event structures reflect causal dependency. So any causal dependency in the game is reflected in, uh, in the game A, is reflected in the game S. But you can see you could have extra causal dependencies, but the only extra causal dependencies are ones of the form where a player move awaits moves of opponent. Possibly, it possibly doesn't await any, possibly waits for several moves of opponent before making that. Now, where do these come from? Uh, they come from a notion of composition, because I'm going to have to say things, cut things short very, very soon, I suppose. They, they come from uh, not just definition by theory, because, but because there's a notion of composing strategies, um, which is basically fulfilling that informal idea I explained um, on. Strategies represented as event strategies and fulfilling that by using the pullback structure. Then you have a notion of composition of, of if you like, pre strategies, and you have a notion of copying that. And then you define your strategies as precisely those which are left invariant under composition by copycat. In other words, those you choose the strategies to be such that copycat acts as identity on them. And that's what gives these two, two, two axioms. They're not just out of the blue, they come as, uh, they come as a theorem of being, as being necessary and sufficient for the strategies to compose well the problem. Now, you don't normally think of uh, games as maps. Here's a little example showing that one could, um, sorry, you don't normally think of strategies as maps. Here's a little example. Normally, you would think of a strategy as being something like, oh, I'm a player, so opponent makes this move, I'll, I'll move on the right. Uh, oh, and uh, then I'll move on the right again, something like that, and I'll move on the left. Uh, but you can describe that by having a kind of subtree, so you could represent that by a map. So traditional ways of thinking about strategies are not so far removed from this idea of representing strategies as maps. This is where pullback comes in. I, it's, it's technical, uh, but it's um, nothing like as technical as it could be if you didn't use the machinery of stable families. Um, you, um, how do you, this is just basically illustrating that you could, that idea of playing, you've got a strategy going from uh, A to B, another one going from B to C. So they're represented in maps like this. You want to play them off over this common game B. Now, the problem is you can't use pullbacks directly because they're pointing to different things. And moreover, there are these polarities in the way. So what you do is you just remove the polarities and pad them out by putting them in parallel with identity maps. Identity of C in this case, identity of A in this case. And then you can take the pullback. And the effect of this is the following. That if you have behavior X in S, behavior Y in T, they represent strategies that can be playing part of the time over B. And what you do is you glue them together over that common part B, provided you don't introduce any causal loops. So that's what, what this is doing. Taking behavior X, behavior Y, 
gluing them together over this common part here. Um, and um, so uh, that's how that works. But then you've got you've got behavior to do with these synchronizations over this common gain B, which you want to hide. You want a strategy to go from A to C rather than have this jump in the middle as well. So you use this is where you use this factorization. You've got um, the composition of the map given by pullback here, composed with the map which elides B here. That's a partial map which has a partial total factorization. And that gives you the composition of strategies. A lot is going on here, as you can imagine. But we can say it, say it in this high level way because of the machinery we've developed. Okay. Um, and this is just more formal definition of what I what I said. It's uh, it's saying that the strategies in order to compose in order to compose well with copy gaps, the copy gaps identity they have to satisfy this receptivity and um, receptivity in innocent conditions. Innocent conditions. Now, just a little. This is just a glimpse of where I was going to go in full full lecture. Special things happen especially in special cases. So choose your games to be special. Choose the games to be stupid games where all the moves are moves of player. Opponent doesn't even get a look at them. But now think about a strategy going from one such stupid game to another such stupid game, going from game A to game B. So that's a strategy in the game, in this compound game, the dual game of A, which is now all player moves, all fresh, now all opponent moves, and parallel with B, which is all player moves. Okay? Because of this duality. Now, we have receptivity that says whatever opponent wants to do can be done in, in strategy. So, kind of whatever opponent does, there's nothing stopping. That's like input. But innocence says that if you have a, a and if you think about um, um, a, a player move here, it's going to be something that manifests it's a move, it's a move over B. The innocence criterion says that the only extra causal connections you can make are ones going from opponent move to player move. So you have connections like this. There may not be any. But there can only be connections of this of this kind, uh, together with the connection causal connections that were originally present. And if this game is if this strategy is deterministic, then given uh, by definition, deterministic strategies are such that opponent uh, if a player behaves deterministically, if opponent behaves deterministically, then in that case, if you've got particular input, you can't have conflicting events here on the right. So what that means is that we're representing some kind of function. Uh, given certain input events in terms of input from the opponent, moves of the opponent, then we can make certain output events, namely moves of play. So we have a certain kind of function going from, from, from configurations of A, the configurations of B. We have a particular wiring like this, and we have a configuration which includes these events. Then we fire this event here as output in B. So we get particular functions. And in fact, we get exactly various stable functions in this way. So in this case, uh, we look at these very stupid games. Um, and deterministic strategies between them, we get exactly various GI domain sort of functions, and we get our model for the landing on this. Now, what I'm not going to now tell you is is all the other all the other things that arise by doing similar 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 functions. Maybe I'll just say it very briefly. There are other stupid games you might choose. You might choose games where you have. Uh, I, uh, another kind of stupid game where you have purely player moves in one game in parallel 
with purely opponent groups, and you regard that as a compound game. And now you think of strategies between two such games. Turns out you get exactly the strategies given by, you get exactly the maps associated with the geometry of interactions. You might want to um, put some imperfect information in your games. You might want to have a stupid game like the one I described, where you have purely player moves in one game, purely opponent moves in another, and make it that opponent can see player, but not the other way around. You can do that by having some extra structure that restricts the causal dependency that a player can make in their strategies. Player, in other words, wouldn't be able to, this kind of simple game, wouldn't be able to use any use anything about, um, wouldn't, use, wouldn't be able to use information about opponents, opponent moves. And in that case, if you look at deterministic strategies there and you add in winning conditions in this thing, which you can do, then you find you get for the deterministic strategies there, you get exactly Gödel's dialectic interpretation, which is quite a complicated gadget for understanding, uh, uh, understanding arithmetic in terms of fairly simple assertions of the form. Uh, there exists X for all Y, and then something that doesn't have any quantifiers. But it only does that by virtue of going very higher order, where the, the Y and the X are higher order functions. Um, and, uh, and as you can imagine, when you start thinking about how you might explain an implication between two, two such things, it's quite complicated. And the way that uh, implication works is by a lens of the kind that you need in functional, functional programming. So, so the point is, by moving to uh, these uh, simple, rather simple, rather naive games, you get you begin to rederive uh, many paradigms that have been discovered, often with quite a lot of ingenuity within this more functional way of looking at things. There's even more to it than that, uh, which is that when you start enriching these strategies by structure, and you want to do it in a functional way, in the sense that you want to um, uh, respect the inclusion on configurations and make your enrichment functorial with respect to that, you end up doing the kind of um, uh, doing the kind of thing that um, effects and event handlers are doing, but in a different vocabulary. And I don't understand this at all. Namely, you end up with functions that look like the kind that we were thinking about before, but now this is local to some little change in the in the strategy. So there are lots of these things glued together. And when you and when you make these things interact, you do it in the kind of way you might expect. Uh, and you can't always combine these parameterized functions in this way, you might introduce loops and do it. But because of the care we've taken in the pullback construction and making sure that we, we make, make sure we don't introduce causal loops when we do compositional strategies, this ends up being well defined and gives you a way of talking about enriched strategies, uh, whether they're enriched with respect to probability or quantum or real numbers or, or smooth maps. Or so it's a way, it's another picture uh, which is tantalizingly similar, but very different in some other ways from the kind of picture that Sam was talking about yesterday. And I would dearly love to understand uh, what the relationship is between this um, way of orchestrating the behavior of functions by strategies that I can only give you a glimpse of here and the uh, very, very, very much more hands-on way of doing that orchestration through effect handles. Okay, um, I don't know how much sense that made, but I tried to give you a glimpse of a bigger picture, uh, and I hope uh, it inspires you to look at some of the references that will be at the end of the first slide, and they'll be available on the, on the web. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for the lecture, Flynn. So if there's any questions around, please feel free to ask or practice.